my name is Joshua Francis Whalen. I'm 59 years old, and I live under the FDR Drive near Stuyvesant Town in Manhattan, about uh, 18th Street and Avenue C. I live there because I'm chronically unemployed and homeless. That first two cups of coffee in the morning is the stuff of life itself and it costs $3 a day. I'm not really sure at this point whether I ever lead a normal life. In fact, you know, I'm, I'm kind of pessimistic about it. I'm very inclined to believe that I never will. Um, it's really difficult to start over at 59 with nothing. Our civilization doesn't let you do that no matter how talented you are. I was a whiz kid. I've attested IQ of 187 since the age of eight. I walked and spoke in complete sentences at the age of nine months. I was teaching the theory of relativity to adults when I was eight years old. And won a full scholarship to St. Anne's School in Brooklyn Heights. Full scholarships to St. Anne's were almost unheard of. And that's really where the trouble begins around that time. My mom started dating a psychopath when I was 12. The psychopath was insanely jealous of me. My mom married the psychopath, and that's about when I started not being able to live at home anymore. And I basically started couch surfing. So I effectively had to drop out of school at 15. I avoided having any official documentation sent to my parents' address because I didn't want them to have my vital records. And this was my big mistake. Now the place I was living was zoned commercially so I could not list it as my residence, and consequently I wasn't able to establish my legal identity until I was almost 30. And that's when I started actually being able to pursue an education again. Up until then I had to work in cash-only economies. I basically lived like an illegal alien because I couldn't cash a check. And if you can't cash a check, you can't sign a contract. You can't take legitimate employment. You're basically an undocumented alien in every way. And it completely excuses you from ever being able to build up a resume that you'll ever be able to use in the professional world. This is why I put off packing up every day. Is this part of the operation it takes so long and it's so unpleasant. So, in the mid-80s, I worked as a bike messenger because I had a boss who was sympathetic to my plight and would cash my paychecks for me. I made really good money being a bike messenger, which was really, really nice. It allowed me to save up enough money to get a computer and start teaching myself how to program and really started climbing the internet learning curve really fast and making really good contacts and connections with the early internet pioneers. And that's basically how I supported myself for, for most of the 90s during my 30s. You know, Alphabet City in those days, it was such an interesting place. It was a really dangerous neighborhood, but at the same time, it was in many ways the exact geometrical, precise center of culture. And it was a wonderful place for me to be. I would have been completely marginalized if I hadn't lived there. I would have had no life at all. So what I started doing was talking to all the bike messengers I knew, because we carried rolls of quarters to make phone calls. And all the homeless people in New York knew that we carried quarters. So they would always be hitting us up for spare change. So I told all the people I knew who were bike messengers, whenever a homeless person asks you for change, tell them to go to Tompkins Square at midnight and we'll feed them. And there had always been a, a handful of homeless people in Tompkins Square. But it was maybe, you know, a few dozen. By the end of 1984, there were about 500. My girlfriend at the time was the chef at the NoHo Star. So she would grab all the leftovers at the end of the night and then my friend Jason worked at a chicken wing joint and he would grab all the chicken wings at the end of the night. And then I was friends with a baker on First Avenue and I'd get all the day old bread from the baker on First Avenue and at midnight me and Jane and Jason would drop all the food off by the band shell in Tompkins Square. 
And by the end of the year, lots of people were doing this. It wasn't just us anymore. The real estate developers had planned to turn Tompkins Square into a gated park, like um, Gramercy Park, where you would need to have a key to the park. Uh, this completely thwarted their plan. This made it impossible for them to do that. At first, I was hauling a 60-pound backpack around with me. I'm not exaggerating this. I was hauling everything I owned around in one huge backpack. And a friend of mine picked up my backpack one day to see how heavy it was and was horrified. He gave me the money to make the initial payment on the storage locker. And that got me started. And then I fundraised on Facebook to pay for it. And that's how I've been paying for it ever since. Well, anyway, altogether I lived out in LA for about two years continuous and was back and forth by coastal for an additional three years. So I moved back to New York thinking, well, you know, I've got all these animation skills, I've got all these computer skills, I don't have any trouble making a living now. And then the internet bubble burst in the summer of 2000. The following spring, work started to return, and then 9-11 happened. So everything shuts down. And at this point, my landlord puts the building on the market. So last of my money goes to pay the lawyer to represent me. Um... All the records I need to prove my case were in Seven World Trade Center. So all the records I need don't exist anymore. So finally, I'm forced to take a buyout or lose the apartment. So I got a very small buyout, and I moved to Vermont because it was cheap. And I just made a whole series of really bad choices when I was in Vermont. And burned through a lot of money. And um, I came back to New York. Um, couch surf for a while and a friend of mine who was the uh, harbor master at New York Skyport Marina on 23rd Street was good enough to me to hire me to work as backhand. Now, the maritime trade, there's a limit to how far up I can go on that because I'm deaf. I'm 85% deaf in both ears. It's a, it's a hereditary hearing loss. It's progressive. I lose about 1% of my remaining hearing every year. Um, good nutrition slows the loss. And if I eat really well, the, the hearing loss slows significantly. I don't eat very well lately. Yeah, you know, I eat enough, I get enough food every day, but I don't really get much in the way of, of quality nutrition. And so I'm starting to, I think I'm starting to experience a little bit of cognitive dysfunction, forgetfulness and things like that. And it, it was really obvious to me I lost my keys at one point and had to uh, beg on Facebook for, for donations to buy all new locks and pay somebody to break the lock on my storage locker so I could get inside it and just all this stuff. It's little mistakes that can kill you if you don't have friends, you know. After losing my keys, I decided that combination locks are really the way to go. The people I know on Facebook have saved my life repeatedly for the last three years. And this bicycle is from my friends on Facebook. That backpack is from my friends on Facebook. If it weren't for their donations, uh, I'd have died two years ago. But the thing that, you know, no amount of donations can do is a kitchen. If I had, like, you know, a kitchen and a little fridge, I could eat so much better and so much cheaper. I hate to say it, but I'm a world-class dumpster diver at this point. Use dried vegetables and tofu. I know where to get fresh vegetables and fresh sushi and all this stuff on a daily basis. But there's no place to store it. It's ad hoc. Each day, sometimes I can get this and sometimes I can get that. And I can get them all fresh and in good condition. But I can never get them all at once. The um, public library doesn't allow you to bring big backpacks into the library with you. And a lot of businesses don't allow you to come in with a big backpack. It's particularly annoying that the library doesn't because the library is public. It's not supposed to discriminate against classes of people who may be facing economic hardship. In fact, it's supposed to be one of the places where people facing economic hardship can not feel shunned because this is a public place that belongs to the public. You know, when everybody else gets a day off, I have an off day. You know, President's Day, I think, really takes on a new meaning when you have the kind of presidents we have these days. 
you know, you should have like uh, reenactments of the storming of the Bastille and the execution of Louis XVI or something. Just, you know, a little warning to some precedent setting events in our history to warn our current presidents about the precedents that they're setting as president. Ah, well, okay, that cracked out. I come here because they have electrical outlets and they have Wi-Fi, and this is where I can charge my gadgets. Whole Foods used to be homeless heaven. There was food, healthy food. They take food stamps and all this. Then, they, then Jeff Bezos bought the place. They removed all of the electrical outlets. It hasn't reduced the number of homeless people hanging out there because that Whole Foods happens to be around the corner from where all the homeless services are located in downtown Manhattan. Consequently, you get a tremendous amount of homeless people. That's who lives in the neighborhood. And they've gone to these tremendous lengths to make that Whole Foods really hostile to poor people. Working at the harbor was great, except it paid really badly. I started a small business of doing tech support. Between those two jobs, I was able to make enough money to live through the winter. Then the company that owned the harbor fired everybody. This gets us up to 2011. In 2011, Occupy Wall Street happened. So I went down and I volunteered my time. And um, to a large extent, the Occupy community has been keeping me alive. It's donations from the Occupy community that have been feeding me for the last eight years. Um, I do a lot of publicity for the Occupy movement and the Sanders campaign online, which is, you know, I, I have to do something to justify my existence at this point. And it's really, it's frustrating to me because I have a lot of talent. I've barely scratched the surface of things I've done with my life that are meaningful. And then Occupy ended. And I couldn't find a place to stay except for my friend Aaron Kay. And the new landlord cut holes in the roof to flood the building. Aaron wasn't willing to fight the landlord. And he took a buyout for a lousy 1,500 bucks. He gave me half of that to his credit. That's about 2015, 2016, thereabouts. And that's when I really ended up on the street. Dinner time. Observe, instant ramen noodles, 75 cents. Freeze-dried onions and the other stuff. I have a broccoli, carrot, potato. Total cost, under a dollar. Altogether, this whole thing runs a little bit under two dollars, actually. And we get out our trusty Swiss Army knife. Now, let me just go to the water fountain and top this up. It takes a total of 12 minutes to cook in the microwave. The potatoes take a long time to get soft. And stir it in there and let it reinflate. A little seaweed, some onions. Gives it a little, little more flavor. Figuring out how to do this without ending up with a miso geyser was not easy. <laughs> I had some spectacular early failures. I generally tended to have a bright, cheery, optimistic attitude. I tended to be very organized, very productive, very efficient, and very resourceful. But teeny tiny little things can kill you when you're on the street. This is uh, almost two years ago now. As I was leaving my campsite one morning, my campsite's right by the FDR, so as I was crossing the street, I got hit from behind by a taxi cab, smacked right into me, knocked me head first into the pavement. I smacked my head into the ground, really fucked up my right knee very badly. You know, just overall really, really hurt myself real bad. The cab driver stood there screaming at me to get up, get up. And, and I'm saying, call an ambulance, please call an ambulance. And this went on for a good 10 minutes before he finally called an ambulance. And I should get a lot of money for this, but I have not been able to find a single lawyer who will do my case. It really infuriates me. 
Yeah, I still have the staples in my scalp because I don't have the money to have them taken out. Emergency Medicaid covers emergencies. Having them put in is an emergency. Having them taken out is not. So the staples are still in my scalp. Going into last winter, I had a funny feeling it was going to be the worst winter I ever faced. And I was right. One morning this winter, I got up and went to get coffee. And when I came back, a workman who works in the parking lot adjacent to where I sleep had poured turpentine and paint all over my favorite sleeping bag. And it also completely ruined my foam pad underneath it. So I had to throw away my favorite sleeping bag. But before the incident with the turpentine, the reason I was sleeping where I was is because about a week before that, I was attacked by an unmedicated schizophrenic who wanted my food. And I offered him my food, but he didn't like the food I offered him. And when I tried to grab something he grabbed back, he just attacked me. I, I did Aikido for a really long time, so I recognize when I see judo because they're related. And this guy knew judo. He must have had judo in childhood or adolescence or whatever. And he almost killed me. He like was actually trying to kill me. He was strangling me. And I was screaming my head off for the cops. And finally, the police came and they arrested both of us and put us both through the system, took us both to Bellevue. And he didn't show up for court. I took an adjournment contemplating dismissal. And if in six months you haven't gotten in trouble with the law again, they dismiss all records of the case ever having existed. Um, I don't go to the shelter system because the shelter system is basically, it's basically jail. The kind of people who are in the shelters are fresh out of Rikers, they're fresh out of Bellevue Mental Institution. The guy who tried to kill me one night, he's in there. Okay? Incidents like that happen in the shelter every single night. It is not a better situation. The reason you see homeless people sleeping on the street is that it is much safer. I don't have any place to shower. Occasionally I can sneak into a public bathroom like here or at Starbucks with my electric shaver and shave. I can get away with that once in a great while. If you're taking too long in the bathroom, they pop the door open to see what you're doing. If you're brushing your teeth, they ban you from that particular restaurant. I need dental care real bad. I've lost two molars because of this. What can I tell you? It's a very boring life. I read a lot, and I promote my political theses. I maintain a blog, occupyyourbrain.tumblr.com. I really don't do a whole hell of a lot, to be honest with you. There isn't a whole hell of a lot I can do. Doing requires being. And when you're a homeless person, you don't exist. About getting out of this mess. Right now, while I'm sleeping on the street, it is physically impossible to make any progress. I can't do anything except survive. If I had, say, a Volkswagen Vanagon camper van, okay, and it's a house, you know, one of those, a couple of solar panels, some batteries, I've got a place to live. I've got a kitchen. I've got a stove. I've got a refrigerator. I've got a warm place that's mine, that I live in. I can start working towards, you know, bringing my programming skills back up to date. At this point in my life, programming will never make me rich. But I can gradually dig myself out of this mess. One thing about being homeless is you start to realize how many decent people there are in the bed. Every once in a while, I'll wake up and there's a $10 bill under my pillow. Every now and then I wake up and there's a big bag of food. Every now and then I wake up and someone has bought a pair of snow boots and left them next to my head. Every now and then somebody leaves me some warm clothing. Every now and then, you know, people just do nice things for you every once in a while. The, the good people outnumber the bad people at least 100 to 1. And it's really a shame, I think, that we let bad people dominate our thoughts. Because the reason we have the society we have is that we let the possibility of bad people vastly overpower our confidence in good people. Right now, we're facing a coronavirus epidemic. One of the ways coronavirus 
is impacting me is that the library has now closed, and that's the only place I can charge my electronics without spending money. Another way is that a large part of the way I get necessities is by dumpster diving. And dumpsters are really not that bad. Dumpsters can actually be pretty good. It's the food that you're getting out of dumpsters a lot of the time is in sealed packages, was sold as fresh half an hour earlier. But um, the stores are closed down. They're running with skeleton staff and skeleton inventory. So there isn't that much in the dumpsters. But the amount of individual citizen donations has gone up dramatically. Cash and material donations from total strangers is roughly tripled, which is a nice thing to see. I think, in a lot of ways, the situation I'm in is a symptom, and I just, being deaf and being 60 and being unemployable, I'm just an early symptom of this, that our civilization is collapsing and we are not coping with it. We are in deep denial that our civilization is literally unraveling. A poster on my Facebook feed mentioned that they were on a long road trip and finding that almost every service area was literally filled with people living in their cars. So we're massively undercounting the number of homeless people. This is accelerating, and it's accelerating mostly amongst people over 50. Our homeless policy is built around the idea that homeless people suffer from mental illnesses or drug problems or other chronic psychological or physical conditions that make them homeless. And the reality is that the majority of homeless today are not drug addicts, they're not mental patients, they're middle-aged and unemployable. I'm eligible for disability because of my deafness, and I was certified for disability in 1991. But because I briefly held a job between then and now, I am no longer eligible for disability. So someone who's never had a drug problem, never had mental illness, never been convicted of a crime of any kind, does not get the back disability they're owed even after a decade of being wrongfully denied because people with drug problems or alcohol problems might go on a binge. So it's this paradox between getting the benefits I'm legally entitled to and letting myself starve to do it or taking a job and being denied benefits forever because I took a job and therefore I'm not, I'm not disabled, okay? I'm denied food stamps because I received donations on Facebook. And if you go into the shelter system right now, you're going to die. The shelter system is full of people who are walking disease vectors. This could just go on like this forever, getting worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. But this could also be the watershed moment that changes everything. It really depends, I guess, on how much people are willing to risk. The top 25% of our population, what we still call middle class, outnumber the critically impoverished, which is what I am, by a significant number. There used to be this thing on TV where you say, for only $2 a month, you can feed this child. Well, if the top 30% adopted a similar position about, you can feed this middle-aged adult, we probably get us all enough income to get ourselves back on our feet and self-employing in some capacity in just a few years. And one way to do that is organize with your neighbors. Adopt the most viable homeless person in your community and get them off the street. Say, okay, this guy is still coherent. He doesn't have a drug problem. He's not mentally ill. Let's get him off the street. Let's get her off the street. Once they're off the street, you move on to the next one. Get them off the street. First step is get them housed. If you just have a bed in your garage with, a, with access to a toilet, a shower, a refrigerator, and a stove, okay, that's enough. That's all it takes to get started. No one is going to solve this for us. We got to solve it ourselves. We have an absentee government. Somebody put this on Facebook recently. Always remember that you are no more than 90 days of bad luck from being where I am but you are never even a lifetime from being where Mike Bloomberg is. Even a lifetime of good luck won't make you Mike Bloomberg. Three months of bad luck will make you Josh Wales.